Bit of backstory for you before we jump into an interview with Mark Noland at Kingston Technology. The server we use here at the studio has been low on space for some time. I've actually had to delete things in order to make room for the shows each week. It's an old server, but it still runs great. A bit on the loud side with those Dell cooling fans, but it runs well, so there's no reason to replace it yet. The storage, however, could use an upgrade. Since transitioning our editing to 4K last fall, it's become obvious that not only is the storage array too small, but the drives aren't fast enough either. So after some research, I picked up Kingston Data Center SSDs. They've got ECC to protect against data corruption, and they're meant for business use in the data center. Now, my data center, as you could, this is it. <laughs> I've got a single old Dell R510 server, uh, but what we'll cover today is completely scalable. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Whether you're a very small business like myself, even a home server, uh, or a web host or large enterprise with many servers, the point is that these competitively priced enterprise SSDs from Kingston can really improve your server's performance. Now for my use here at Category 5 TV, I went with the DC500Rs because they're optimized for read intensive application. That should do really well for our video editing. Of course, I also use the server for general data storage to hold past seasons of videos. Plus I run a few virtual machines on there to run our internal infrastructure. Um, so needless to say, Kingston's DC500Rs are gonna be ideal, not just for my general use, but the bursts of sudden read speed I need when loading big video files. They've also got DC500Ms as well, uh, and if you need higher write speed, those will fit the bill, being a really great big bang for the buck all-round SSD for servers. I wanted to know how much of a difference the upgrade actually made, so I set up a comparison with the hopes of making it as close of a one-to-one -one as possible. So I chose a RAID 5 with four disks each, and before I ran the tests, I updated the RAID controller firmware. While it is an old server, I thought it'd be best to make sure everything is as up-to-date as possible. From there, along with some helpful advice from Kingston's FIO expert, Matt Eaton, I wrote a benchmark script that I could run against both my original spinning drives and the new Kingston SSDs, giving me a pretty good view of how the performance compares. The code's on my GitHub page and the link is in the video description below. Huge thanks to Matt for all of his help, and also Dave Leong for, among other things, helping connect me with the right people at Kingston. I did a fair amount of preconditioning on the drives, though time was of a factor here as well, and since the spinners were taking an unreal amount of time to precondition, I did cut that process short. It should be noted too that the drives are different capacities, so this is by no means apples to apples. But in a real-world environment such as ours here at the studio, I'm happy just to know that there's a perceptible improvement, with reasonably accurate numbers to back that up. I brought the server nearly to its knees. The FIO tests were brutal on these old spinner drives, uh, but they completed way faster on the SSDs. So I grabbed some 2.5 to 3.5 inch adapters that'll match up nicely with the server's backplane since the Dell trays only support 3.5 inch drives. Firing up the server with the SSDs and all appears to work great, but all the drives are flashing an amber light. I asked Mark from Kingston if this was a concern. Well, uh, with Dell, where did you get the drive sled? Wait a minute. So you're telling me these fancy expensive drive adapters are what's causing this? It's the drive sled. The drive set has a chipset on it. All right, let's try a different approach then. Commander Muffiff posted Thing 1830990 to Thingiverse, which looks promising. I've got the link in the description below. Let's give it a shot. Success! The Kingston DC500s connected directly to the backplane using 3D printed adapters did the trick. Now I'd like to briefly digress because this is another testament to the cost savings of owning a 3D printer. Now I paid $16 each for these adapters. The ones I printed myself 
these worked better. And now while I used expensive PLA plus filament, which costs $40 per kilogram, each tray adapter, which is 14 grams, uh, price, that prices it at only 56 cents each. So the material cost being 56 cents, I saved $15.44 per tray adapter. That's a grand total of $123.52 saved to print eight adapters myself. If I did that just two more times, I've already offset the upfront expense of buying my 3D printer in savings alone. Anyway, back to our subject, but first, a quick word from our sponsors. When we return, Mark Nolan joins us from Kingston to make sense of the file results and talk about how business users can further improve the performance of the data center. Stick around. I've run the FIO tests on all the drives and I've passed the numbers on to the team at Kingston so they can help make sense of the test results. And here's what those numbers look like. So in the middle column there, I've got the four Dell Constellation ES drives. Those have the SAS interface running at 7200 RPM and I've configured them in a RAID 5. You can see the IOPS input output per second uh, is very, very poor by contrast to the SSDs in the far right column. Those are the DC 500 Rs from Kingston and those again are configured in the same way, a RAID 5 with four drives. However, these ones are one terabyte drives versus the spinning drives that are two terabytes each. No not apples to apples, but you can see clearly that the speed is significantly improved on the SSDs. Mark Noland is a field application engineer from Kingston Technology. Mark, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Howdy. How are you today? Great. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you do at Kingston. Uh, so I'm, my title is field applications engineer, uh, but I interface a lot with uh, clients and users at data centers. Um, I also, you know, in my background, I, I used to work for Autodesk uh, in the film and video industry mm. um, and dealt with like sort of everything from the desktop application back to the data center, you know. Uh, so if you, if you break a bottleneck at the desktop, you know, then your next bottleneck is the network. And once you break that, then your bottleneck is on the server. And so um, just basically trying to troubleshoot and and break bottlenecks, whether it's, you know, uh, databases or, you know, uh, 8K video editing systems, mm. uh, things like that. Uh, they all need uh, big, fast data going through pipes. Don't I know it. Don't I know it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So you've seen. That's quite a setup you've got there. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, well, and you've seen our FIO numbers from our test today. Um, and I, I do realize that those numbers are slightly arbitrary. Um, however, what I did is I ran the same tests against the same scenario on our old spinning drives as I did on DC 500Rs. So just looking at those numbers, can you help us to make sense of what's, what's actually happening there? Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, first of all, both, you know, both the SSDs and the hard drives are connected to the SATA bus. Right. Uh, same server, like all of the, the hardware is the same, just the drives have changed. Yeah. The SATA bus is one of the older um, connection methods in, in the, in the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has, uh, you know, a few uh, uh, weaknesses in that uh, sort of, you can only be reading or writing to it at any one time. Uh, but, the, you know, with RAID controllers and that, they've gotten really good at being able to optimize that uh, the best way possible. So then you come down to the uh, raw, you know, uh, interface differences between a hard drive, spinning disk, and SSDs. And, you know, SS, uh, SSDs have been modified. You know, it's a, a, a solid state disk. It's basically you've got computer memory NAND that is being uh, routed to speak uh, disk language, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, uh, in a way, you're sort of uh, hobbling the uh, the uh, fast NAND that's in there by making it go through the uh, uh, SATA interface. Sure. But, uh, 
and it has to pretend that it is, uh, it has to like at least translate to speak disk language. So when you've got like uh, the old school heart spinning disk hard drives, um, you know, they're, they're pretty good at doing sequential stuff. Uh, random, they start choking. And when it comes to IOPS, um, they, they really have a hard time keeping up with uh, um, the memory. And you can see, you know, which parts are uh, uh, in the difference between your test scores. You can see which parts are, you know, low because of the spinning disk itself. Yeah. And ones that, you know, uh, uh, are like the uh, NAND on an SSD is actually able to, you know, still put pretty good uh, bandwidth through. So like uh, in your in your uh, read and write performance, um, you know, the SSDs are anywhere between like on the read, maybe four times faster than uh, the fastest rate of hard drives that you have going. Right. Um, this is also, you're, you're doing RAID 5, so there's a little bit of overhead with disk management. So if you did RAID 0 on both the Ooh. SSDs and-, and <laughs> I need well, redundancy. Yeah, no, you, yeah, yeah, you have no redundancy. But if you do RAID 0, you know, then you can see raw bandwidth sure. uh, happening, right? Yeah. Uh, but, and and that, that's when SSDs would even take a step above, you know, SAT SSDs would be even faster uh, without that redundancy happening because mm. uh, there's a certain amount of uh, overhead that's happening to, to do that. But uh, even with your RAID 5 setup, you're still looking at uh, about three times faster for SSDs than hard drives uh, on a, on a re, on a write mm -hmm. and four times faster on the read uh, typically. But the the one sort of secret place that it ends up being much, much faster is uh, in the latency. So that's like the time between when I click and submit a request to the time that uh, it actually starts happening. Right. Um, you know, if, if, if it's like a random IO uh, event, it might be, you know, uh, when your drives are warmed up and everything, it might be uh, like 0.8 milliseconds to 1.2 milliseconds, depending. Uh, whereas on the SSD, it's going to be microseconds. So even if it's 20 microseconds uh, and you have a rate of four drives, if you say that your average latency per drive was one millisecond on a hard drive, and it's like 20 microseconds on the SSD, then uh, you haven't even gotten to a microsecond by the time you add up that latency uh, across the four drives. Wow. So um, it, it, the latency is a big difference and then the quality of service. So one of the things that we really tested the data center, the DC 500 and 450 and DC 1000 drives, uh, they're, they're tested extensively for you know uh, quality of service. That's the main, the main thing you're looking for if you're putting them into a, a data center like tier two cloud something like that mm -hmm. uh, you want a quality of service where uh you know a consumer ssd might peak and deliver super performance for a short period of time and if you're only transferring a couple gigs at a time that's what you want it's on your laptop right you know you're trying to get things on and off really quick that's awesome but if you're if you're running a drive you know, 24 seven with a database with, for online transactions, uh, you're writing to it and reading from it like constantly. Mm -hmm. And you you don't wanna see big spikes up or down in the performance. You wanna see like a, a really flat line in that performance. And, and you'll see that with like a hard drive, you know, uh, it'll spike up really fast initially because it's got a oh, big yeah. DRAM cat. <laughs> Anytime you're and transferring a video file or something, it's like yeah. fast and then... And then it'll <laughs> plummet down to, all right, 200 megabytes per second. And then it goes 30 megabytes yes. per second. And you're like, <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Uh, and, and the problem is that at a certain point, you're running out of cash or oh, something like that. Okay. So in, in that, uh, you know, in, in your uh, FIO script, uh, one of the important things to do if you're wanting to test for data center use is to do that uh, warm up on the drive to have it burned in so that uh, it's not just like fresh out of the box. I just installed it and all the sectors are blank and and you know like because uh, it's not having to have any overhead of managing uh, data on the drive right, that you okay. would see when the drives in use. Mm -hmm. So is that the and, is that kind of the key difference between the consumer SSDs that I have in my laptop in my home computers versus these data center drives? Yeah, that and uh, you might see over provisioning differences. Um, 
like our uh, DC uh, drives, um, number one, they have a, a decent amount of uh, DRAM mm -hmm. cache on them, uh, where a lot of consumer drives might have uh, a pseudo SLC, where they take TLC or QLC memory and program it as SLC. So rather than, you know, they might take a sector, a section of the drive and, and say, this is going to be programmed as SLC. So I'm only going to store one bit of data in this cell instead of the three or four. Like if it's a TLC, you're storing three bits of data and, and uh, or bytes and and uh, and QLC, you're storing four. So you've got much more data that's being stored there. Uh, you know, we had MLC, uh, but then it was TLC and you know, QLC and, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to cram more, more bits into uh, uh, the more cells. Uh, and as you do that, it gets, you know, uh, it takes a little longer to program uh, all those uh, bytes and bits into uh, the different cells. So if you use the pseudo cache of SLC, which we do on a few drives as well in consumer, uh, but uh, you're, it, the reason you do it is that it's much less expensive than using DRAM. Hmm. And so uh, on our on our data center drives, they they all have like a nice big DRAM cache on them. That's one of the big differences. Oh, okay. And so uh, that that combined with uh, the over provisioning that is on uh, our data center drives allows for, uh, and as well as tweaks in the firmware, it allows for really a uh, high level of quality of service. So. You don't see big spikes way up and then way down and, and going, you know, right. like where you're at the max performance of the bus down to zero, back to the middle. And mm -hmm. are you, uh, you when know, you say when you say you, over provisioning, are you talking about I.O.? Now, over provisioning is where if I have like if, if you see uh, an SSD that has say it has 940 or 960 gigs yeah. uh, of 960 gig capacity is really common, right? Yeah. That, that's a terabyte of NAND that's on there, mm -hmm. and it has over-provisioning of uh, three to five percent. For the data uh, itself, the, so the storage. Yeah. Okay. And so when, when you see a drive that says one terabyte, uh, lots of times that's still the same amount of NAND as if you bought a, a 960, but the, the thing that you'll notice is like on a consumer drive, if you get up to being 90% full on one that's not over-provisioned, mm -hmm. You'll start. You'll see the performance also start to tank. Whereas oh. if you have one that, if you have the, you know, the 960 gig drive, it can be 90 percent full, and you'll still be writing at the same speed as when it was empty. Hmm. Uh, you know, you, you, it. Well, I won't say when it was empty because one of the things that we do that uh, preconditioning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of our uh, script that we, we, we're working on there. Uh, that preconditioning basically make sure that it, the drive's sort of dirtied up and and uh, is doing real workload type stuff. So you, right. can, cause you can test anything out of the box and it might look spectacular, but then when you put it into real use, uh, throw it into a data center and, you know, a week into being used, you're like, this is not performing the way it did, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I threw these consumer drives in there and they were great. And now they're uh, terrible. Yeah. Um, Oh, I because see that like, on my, yeah, I've seen that on desktop drives and, and things like that. Yeah, when they get warmed up and dirty and they sense. start, uh, they, they're they under real world working conditions and mm -hmm. not just running a benchmark. Hmm. And now my IOPS on the, and you mentioned IOPS, maybe I could get you to briefly explain what that means to us. Um, but it is through the roof higher uh, on the SSDs. What does that, yep. what does that tell us? So, uh, Part of that is is because of the it's physics, right? So on the science, SSD, kids. it's it's science. <laughs> it, it, we're talking about physics because the uh, hard drive is actually relying uh, for the IOPS. It actually has that that needle that moves back and forth with the reader the head. Physical drives, yeah, the the spinning and, drives. And, and so it actually has to, in order to read a point, it has to physically move to somewhere, mm -hmm. find that read it, uh, verify it, and then move to the next point, find it, read it, and verify it. So uh, just because of the way physics and thermo thermodynamics work, the drive can't spin any faster. They, you know, hard drives are really, really great for what they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you can get really big hard drives, 
and they're pretty durable, uh, but physics can't take them any farther. Because and, and so when you go over to yeah, uh, an SSD, uh, you're just everything's uh, done through solid state. You're not moving anything mm -hmm. except electrons. And so, uh, you know, you're, you, you have like your seek times go down by a thousand fold. Uh, and that's why you'll see what the IOPS difference, um, the random read, which was your best on the uh, hard drives, random read of 673 IOPS, whereas the random read on the RAID of uh, DC500R was 121,000 IOPS. So, uh, <laughs> 180 times the speed. Yeah, it's it's just a little faster. A little bit. <laughs> That's amazing. So now we understand now that, so I've jumped from um, going from the spinning drives to the SSDs. Now my bottleneck is SATA, the, yep. the connection. Yeah, so so uh, that uh, 121,000 IOPS uh, uh, with that, if you went to, now you go to PCIe-based drives, mm -hmm. uh, PCIe Gen 3, NVMe-type drives, uh, so either uh, M.2 or U.2. Um, U.2 is more friendly to a data center because it is in that two and a half inch form factor right. rather than the, the gumstick form factor, which is a little difficult to manage. There's a few people that have uh, adapters and things like that to put lots of M.2s into servers, but um, you know, I think the the U.2 and the ruler are going to be much more common uh, going forward for putting in lots of you know like 24 or more uh, U.2 drives, uh, like NVMe SSDs into a server. Uh, but now you're talking like the IOPS go up another f factor, right? Um, so like uh, an NVMe drive because it's not limited to uh, by the SATA bus, uh, it, it uh, is limited by the PCIe bus. So, um, you know, you go to Gen 4, and that's twice as fast as Gen 3. So, you know, potentially twice as fast. I haven't seen any models where, it, uh, like, it, it is twice as fast, but, you know, significantly, Gen 4 demos that I've seen are significantly faster. Like, uh, uh, you know, you're talking off of, by 16, uh, I think I, the fastest demo I've seen so far is about 25 gigabytes per second off of one device on one Gen 4 Gigabytes slot. per gigabytes second. Gigabytes per second, wow. yeah. So, and, and I don't know how scalable that is currently, but that was when Gen 4 was still experimental, which it's a little experimental. I think the AMD one is, is looking really good, but... Uh, uh, I'll call it kind of experimental until Intel and AMD both have their Gen 4 out and, and uh, all of the uh, enterprise servers are shipping with Gen 4 PCIe because yeah. at this point it, it's a really cool gamer box or a, a really <laughs> high end, a really high end workstation. Sure. You know, like it, uh, NVIDIA's got a lot of cool demos with four GPUs on an AMD proc with, uh, you know, lots of NVMe uh, uh drives connected to it and they're doing some really neat demos and as is amd with their their gpus um but all, all of that right now seems it, it it's like uh, if i have to go drop uh five to twenty grand on a workstation um I, i'm gonna wait till it's uh somebody else uh works out all the wrinkles in that yeah. experiment. <laughs> so thinking about my use case, so I obviously work here in a studio, so I'm doing a lot of video production. Uh, maybe some of our viewers are working in an office environment where they've got similar scenarios where, hey, we've got to replace the drives in an older server, or maybe it's not even that old, but um, they're, they're not necessarily replacing an entire server. They just want to put SSDs in instead of the spinning drives because they're kind of the way to go right now. And, and we're certainly seeing a big performance boost here. Um, is there, you know, where, where is the performance gain? So for me, it's, it's in editing real time 4k video. It's, it's brilliant on the, on the DC 500 Rs. Um, where, where is the, the average business consumer um, IT department going to find gains uh, by upgrading the servers to SSD? 
Well, I, I think uh, client satisfaction, and uh, my my uh, dad's a dentist, and my mom's a lawyer, and and uh, I used to do some computer tech support for people in those communities, and and you know, like uh, uh, doctors and lawyers are notoriously cheap when it comes to you know, like uh, spending money on on systems like that. But <laughs> those systems also drive all of the uh, all of the. Uh, revenue in their business so it's really important for them to keep them updated and, mm -hmm. and uh it, i think the thing that you get by going from hard drive to ssds on an upgrade of an older system you know is you'll be able to wring at least two or three more years out of it if not more um you know you'll you you'll you always hit a bottleneck somewhere but rather than your system being the bottleneck it might be the os or the version of the software that you're using or right. something like that but uh you, you'll make something much more usable. I don't, have you ever taken an old hard drive SS or a whole old hard drive laptop and put an SSD in it? And, you know, it's like all of a sudden it's like, what, why was I going to get rid of this thing? It's so fast. <laughs> exactly. It like breathes new life into an old <laughs> system. And that's exactly yeah. what this has done for our server. And I, and as you're talking about bottlenecks, I'm thinking, okay, well, SATA is six gig a second. So I think my bottleneck actually, Mark, is going to be my networking because I'm only on gig in, uh, Ethernet. So yeah. that's my bottleneck. But it, being a, a very small business myself, having gig inter, uh, Ethernet and being able to edit video over one gig a second is is stellar. It's superb. Um, well, the, the the trick, you know, for that, like, because my job was breaking those kind of bottlenecks uh, previously, is I would put uh, 10 gig uh, on your server and yep. have a switch that distributes it out to your gigabit clients and 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 tell you uh get uh 10 gig uh at your desktop or something but you could always go you know like uh, do it gradually just like adding uh ssds to your uh, uh legacy systems mm -hmm. yeah uh that's a good idea just kind of upgrade the the networking as i go <laughs> that's the next step yeah um, what kind of longevity am i going to be looking at um for ssds i know like when ssds first came out so years ago um, there were those of us who were uh, uh, hesitant and afraid to switch to SSD because the, they weren't quite as reliable, but that has completely changed over the past several years. Are we yeah. like, what kind of lifespan do we expect from like your, your data center drives? Uh, so our data center drives, we warrant them for five years. Uh, and then, you know, like the, they have different, um, drive rights per day warranties as well. So like the DC 500, that's a 0.3 drive right per day. So if you have a four terabyte or a three, three point, uh, what was it 3.86? Uh, if you have a four, essentially there's four terabytes of NAND on there, but if you have like a four terabyte drive or an eight terabyte drive of the R, which is a read centric model, you can get uh, up to, uh, you can do, uh, 0.3 drive rights per day. Um, uh, the M version of that is 1.5 drive rights per day. And if you mm. think about that, for a four terabyte drive, that's if a you're lot of data. Writing, yeah. If you're writing, uh, you know, like uh, six terabytes a day, uh, you might be running Facebook off of your uh, <laughs> server. I don't know. That, that's a lot of data to fill up and delete because that's it, it's not so much about um, you know, like if you're just collecting drives or uh, collecting data on your drives, that's what the R is all about, right? So the read centric one, if I want to like have a database full of video and images and text files and spreadsheets and stuff that's going to live there forever, um, the, the DC 500 R is a really great drive because I'm just adding stuff to it all the time. I'm not adding, you know, like a terabyte at a time and then calculating that data and deleting the whole thing and and putting in the answer that's another terabyte um you know that that's something like a, a lamp where you've got you know apache server and and or an oltp server or you know some kind of online transaction thing where you know uh, uh you're you're just grinding through the data like you know mm -hmm. facebook where you're just adding new cat videos all the time and then deleting them <laughs> as they get old right um you know, uh, most people don't do that. Like I, I've got a, a Drobo uh, server that I just add stuff to constantly. So mm -hmm. uh, 
I actually had to uh, unplug it because it's so loud because of all the hard drives. I'm going to put uh, four, four terabyte SSDs in there. Perfect. That'll make it quiet. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's pretty quiet all of a sudden. It, it's interesting and, you say that, like, because that's the other thing that we don't necessarily think about with the upgrade is the the silence of them, the energy efficiency. Yeah. Well, I, I I have to say that SSDs uh, compared to hard drive energy efficiency, hard drives are actually really good at when they're not being used, shutting down. Like they they they've really gotten good at being energy efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I don't think that anybody's replacing hard drives with like, uh, well, they have their that's place. exactly what we are they exactly have their place. replacing hard drives, yeah. but they have their places. Like uh, if I want to store 40 uh, terabytes of data, that's just cold data mm -hmm. that I'm not going to access all the time, but I, re I need for legal reasons or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like to make me feel secure or it's my backup that's a perfect use for hard drives. If, if you have data that you want to be able to read and work off of, uh, hard drives are terrible for that just because of the latency. And, you know, it's like if you're one user and you are getting the data off the hard drives, it's bad enough to have to wait for it. But if you've got like 10 users or even, you know, three or four users that are all hitting that uh, hard drive array at the same time, you can start, you know, like, hey, you know, like, why, why is everything slowing down so yeah. much? And it's like, um, you know, uh, you, you'll also see a lot better multi-user uh, efficacy happening when uh, when you go to uh, SSDs, hmm. just because of the, the latency. Lots of great information. I mean, I'm, I'm all kinds of thoughts going through my head. I'm thinking about how some servers, like you've got multiple users all connecting for Samba shares and accessing files or even accessing things like their bookkeeping software simultaneously on a single spinning hard drive in a s system or something that's like the the difference in the well if, if you think about the the uh vm language of spin up a, a virtual machine yeah. uh when you are coming off of a, a sata drive there's still a little spin up time but it it's like a fraction of uh what the spin up time because it really is a spin up time off of hard drives mm -hmm. uh and then if you go to nvme it's it's almost like it was in dram you know it's like because the nvme drives being the you know it's off the sata bus and on to the uh, pcie bus it's one step closer to the uh, processor mm -hmm. uh, we and that's why like dram is the best because it's on the processor right sure or even the the you know, I guess the cache and the processor is on the processor, but it's also not connected to your uh, display and and all that. So yeah. uh, DRAM is sort of the king, of, and which we also make. There, there's all these um, kind of irrelevant almost benchmarks of people turning on their computer and how long does it take to boot? And it's, and it's, it's kind of irrelevant in so many ways. And it makes me think about those spinning, those drives spinning up. We have such a... Uh, we, we have a tendency to look at, okay, when I click on something, how quickly does it happen? How quickly does that application come up? And for me in this scenario, how quickly am I able to open large video files in my editor? And right. that's like where, yeah, I'm not having to wait for, for that. That moment is just an instant moment for me. I would do, uh, so I, I, a lot of the, I would create demos for when we go to trade shows like NIB, the broadcasters, uh, North America Broadcasters Show or IBC mm -hmm. in Amsterdam. Uh, I'd create some demos with Adobe. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we'd have to do there is like if we're editing 8K or, you know, 4K or 8K video, you have to make sure that the clips are long enough to uh, blow out any DRAM that you have, oh. uh, you know, because if, if, you know, like if I'm editing and it's really small files, they could all just live in DRAM or, you know, and I wouldn't know the difference. Wow. You know, it's like it could be coming off a hard drive, but the first time I read it, it's really slow. But after that, it's nice and fast because uh, the if the files are tiny. But if you are trying to pull like 4K still frames rather than an AVI or a QuickTime, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that because the uh, AVI or QuickTime might be able to be stored in if you have 64 or 128 gigs of memory in your system, right. you might be able to store most of the video there. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you don't really see the performance of uh, the SSDs until you have something that sort of outmatches the amount of DRAM that you have available to you.
Mark, if I may change directions just a little bit as we approach closing our interview off, um, one of the things as a business user that are that's really important to me is knowing that I can get support when I need it. And throughout the course of this process in upgrading my server, uh, one of the things that really stands out to me is the fact that your team was there for me every step of the way. Um, is that is that pretty typical of Kingston? Uh, before I worked here, I. I didn't know that much about Kingston. I've, I've worked here for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really uh, blew me away was the level of support. So uh, if you have a, whether you have a problem with like a, a HyperX uh, microphone like this or the headset uh, or a keyboard or DRAM or uh, an SSD, if you call our support number, we have people uh, here in Southern California and Orange County that answer the phone. There's not a data center somewhere around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so during the day, it's going to be people in Orange County. If you call at three in the morning, it's going to be people in England. Very good. Um, so we've got uh, really great support where if you have a real problem that they can't solve with uh, you know the all their known database of issues, uh, it ends up to me and the engineering team for SSDs if it goes to us, um, it, like within a half an hour, it, it's in our inbox and wow. and you've got like a whole engineering team from uh, Southern California to uh, Europe and, and Taiwan that are all dealing with it uh, personally. So fantastic. Uh, I think that's one of the big differences. Like a, I, I've had problems with uh, drives from other manufacturers that I've worked at other manufacturers and, and I couldn't get anybody to right. support me hmm. <laughs> at the manufacturer that I worked at previously. Wow. Uh, That's great. And uh, there's something to be said for good support. Absolutely. Um, now, you mentioned the HyperX line of consumer products. Of course, I've experienced it from the enterprise kind of level. Um, is this you know, level of support something that can be expected from consumers as well as business users? Well, yeah, absolutely. Like I was saying, like uh, uh, we've we've actually had people, you know, like with broken keyboards or, you know, it's a, it's uh, you know, it's it's all one number. I mean, Kingston, and uh, you know, has the HyperX brand for gaming, but we also do you know high-end uh, server products, DRAM and SSDs mm -hmm. uh, for the data center, as well as you know consumer DRAM and consumer SSDs and USB sticks uh, from consumer ones to all the way to the encrypted ones with keypads on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the other things that also surprised me coming from another uh, company to Kingston was uh, the level of testing. So 100% uh, of our data center uh, SSDs and, and DRAM, there, there, there is every piece is tested. Uh, they, you know, like they, uh, the server stuff goes through a more rigorous test, uh, but they simulate like three months worth of uh, 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 use on the D, on the DRAM side and, and, uh, uh, like all the SSDs are tested at uh, in an oven, basically, while they're when they're being manufactured, they're all tested at a high temperature to make sure that they are uh, functioning uh, in an optimal fashion. Fantastic. Big thanks to our guest, Mark Noland, who joined us from Kingston today mm -hmm. uh, to talk about those drives. Really, really exciting stuff. Hey, um, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. LinuxTechShow.com is a great way to find us there. Also, if you love what we do, please become a patron, patreon.com slash category five. But that's all the time we got, so we're out of here. Take yeah. care, we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.